But before Michael Jordan's father passed away in uh, 1993, uh, Michael said in an interview with columnist Bob Green, my heroes are and were my parents. It wasn't that the rest of the world necessarily thought them to be heroic, but they were the adults that I saw constantly, and I admired what I saw. If you're lucky, you grow up in a house where you can learn what kind of person you should be by watching your parents. Amen. And in that count, I was a very lucky man. I ha it has been the luckiest thing that has ever happened to me. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 is the second of three house codes that Paul writes about in Ephesians 5 and 6. We looked at the first house code last week. It was the husband-wife relationship. Today, the second house code is the parent-child relationship. In the Roman Empire in which Paul lived, the Jews and the Christians alike were considered to be a threat to the Roman society. So Paul writes this passage not just to give instructions to the parent-child relationship, but also so that the, it will be a witness to the Roman government so that the Roman pagan empire will see that the Christians have a high standard of conduct between the parent-child relationship. And a sense, Paul says, we are very much in support of family. In fact, we are driven by something greater than the Roman empire. We are driven by the spiritual presence of Christ in our life. So today, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, the first Four verses, we, we are continuing in our series entitled, Live Like Christ. And today we're going to look at Live Like Christ by, by honoring God through the parent-child relationship. So Ephesians 6, the first four verses says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise so that it may go well with you and that you may have long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Now, those four verses divide up very easily into two sections. There's instructions to children and instructions to fathers. Now, I'm going to make the application to parents in general, but I don't want us to lose men that verse 4 specifically says fathers. Again, I'm going to apply it to parents, mom and dads, but don't miss out that it specifically says fathers. So let's look at those two things as our major points of our outline. First, verses 1 through 3. As a child, I should honor God and how I respond to my parents. In the Greco-Roman world, children and slaves, verse 5, we'll get to that next week, they were in a lower status socially than the women from last week's message. But as we learn from last week's message, Paul and Christianity elevated the woman's status, elevated the woman's freedom. And here in this passage, Paul is going to elevate the status or the importance of children as well. This passage addresses children first. But because that was kind of the order of the house code of that day, but in, in real practical purposes, we know that a parent is going to nurture a child before a child is able, able to obey a parent. We know that in the natural response of things, that the parent is going to be doing verse 4 before the child is able to do verses 1 through 3. So let me show you three things that the child is to do based on these verses. First... I should obey my parents in the Lord. So that's the first thing, I should obey my parents in the Lord. Now, uh, notice that it says in verse uh, 1, it says, children obey your parents. It doesn't say boys obey your parents. It says children obey your parents. That's an important distinction because actually uh, girls had much less status than even a boy child would in that day. And again, Paul is elevating the female in this by saying, boys and girls, children, you are to obey your parents. Five different times in the New Testament, children are told to obey their parents. And each time, it is a paraphrase from two parts of the Old Testament. From Deuteronomy 5.16, 
and Exodus 20, 12. Exodus 20, 12, by the way, is the list of Ten Commandments. And the fifth commandment is uh, that children are to obey their parents. And now, obeying your parents is going to look different for a five-year-old and a 25-year-old and a 45-year-old. But there still is some obedience there. Notice what it says in verse 1. It says that children are, are to obey their parents in the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that you obey your parents only if they're Christians. What it means is that part of you being a Christ follower and being a disciple of Christ is that you're going to obey your parents because you are in the Lord. Amen. That children were to obey their parents was really part of the Greco-Roman culture. They very much believed in the authority, especially of the father, and how children were to obey the father. But Paul elevates that instead of it just being a social reason to obey the parents. He gives a spiritual reason to obey the parents. Because you're in the Lord, you are to obey your, parent, your, your parents. The word children, not only is it uh, both male and female, but children can refer to any child of any age. But based on the context, I would guess, I, I have no uh, 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 factual information, I would guess based on the context that the children is referring to those still living within the home uh, and especially those maybe that are nearing independence. So first, I should obey my parents in the Lord. Secondly, verse 2, I should honor my parents. Now we go a little different. There's one thing to obey. Now we're getting to honor. That's even deeper. Honor means to bestow special marks of honor. It means to show favor to someone. It means to treat someone like a prize, valuable. Children are to, honor, are to honor their parents by giving their parents attention, expressing thanks, seeking to help their parents. You know, not everyone can directly be involved in taking care of their parents as they age. I understand that sometimes that's not realistic. We're not in a position to do that. But if you can, whatever help you can give as your parents age is an opportunity to show honor. Uh, Diane and I, I feel now, we, we had a tremendously blessed opportunity to take care of her mom the last five months of her life. Now, many of you helped us in that, and so we had a great church support. We didn't do it, do it on our own. But we went into that with great fear about a year ago. We went into that with great fear, wondering if we were going to be able to do it. But after, after everything unfolded, it ended up being one of the greatest blessings we ever had. So if you have that opportunity, it is a great blessing. Holding hatred and resentment in our hearts towards our parents isn't honorable. It doesn't matter how unhonorable our parents have been, Vengeance is not something that people of the cross should be about, Amen. no matter how poorly our parents have behaved. Uh, honoring parents can really be an opportunity to show you're a disciple. I mean, it's an opportunity to show I really am a Christ follower. I'm, I'm going to honor my parents, even though they haven't been very honorable. And now these verses, I, I will admit, they, they are probably assuming the best scenario. They're assuming great parents and great kids of course, you know that sometimes that doesn't happen. There's not always great parents, and there's not always great kids. But God is calling us to, to honor the best we can with the, with the help of God, with the power of God in our lives to honor. Uh, these verses are, are not calling us to disobey God, to obey our parents. I don't want you to... If your parents are asking you or leading you to sin then the, the honoring of God and the obeying of God takes precedence over any other relationship. Amen. But what these verses are asking us to do is that we might have to pray like we've never prayed before, and we might have to read our Bible like we've never read our Bible before to honor our parents, especially if they have not been honorable in their behavior. That leads me to a third thing about the children. And that is there is a motivation for obedience and honor. So what Paul does in verse 1 and then again in verse 3, Paul lists three motivations why children, children of any age, 
should honor their parents. The first one he says in verse 1, he says, because this is right. He says, children, obey your parents because this is right. This actually goes back to chapter 5, verse 3, which really began this series uh, a month ago on being, or, or, or being like Christ, living like Christ. Uh, it says in chapter 5, verse 3, that we are to do things that are proper of the saints. So if you are a Christ follower, you're a saint. I don't, I, maybe you didn't realize that, but you are a saint if you are a Christ follower. Amen. And so as a Christ follower, it's the right thing to do to honor your parents. Second motivation, because it will go well with you. Uh, that, that's according to verse 3. In other words, you'll be better off honoring your parents than not honoring your parents. For good or bad, our psyche is tied to our parents. Good or bad. Third motivation is found in the last part of verse 3, because you will have a long life, it says. Honoring parents was a, a central foundation for uh, the covenant people of God. That's why it was part of the Ten Commandments, because it was part of being a covenant people of God, because uh, God knew that when the parent-child relationship is the way it's supposed to be, it will bring stability to the rest of society. Don't have time for a rant, but just a statement. Could it be that the societal ills we experience today are because of the breakdown of the family? I think most of us would see that the family broke down long before society broke down, and that's because God knows society starts with the family. Amen. So that uh, leads me to what the parent is to do in, in honoring the parent or, or the, the, the parent and how the parent is supposed to act towards the child. So the second big thing to look at is, as a parent, I should honor God in how I relate to my children. Verse 4. Fathers, which is what's addressed in verse 4, had legal control of their children in, in the Roman system of government. They were responsible for the child from the age of seven up. Now, the mom was responsible for those early, what we'd call preschool days. But then when the formal education started at seven, the father was responsible. And the father in the Greco-Roman Empire, he had a complete control and authority. And sometimes he used that authority in a harsh way. They, they, they determined back then whether or not a newborn would live or not, the father decided. And it wasn't unusual at all in, in the Roman government for the father to decide if it was a girl that was born to desert the girl and let her die because they were not considered to be as important as a male baby. Sometimes in the Greco-Roman world, fathers even sold their children into slavery. And, and, and Paul calls us here to a higher standard than that. He calls us to treat our children with, with nurture and with encouragement and with love. So really that there, are, there are two things mentioned in verse 4 for the father. One is something not to do, and the other is something to do. So there's a negative and a positive. We're going to apply it to both mom and dad, but specifically it's talking about the father. So first, parents don't exasperate your child. Now, I'm almost sure... That's the King James Version, exasperate, because that's, that's kind of what I was brought up on, so that's the word that just came to my mind. But exasperate, uh, it, re it really means to stir up anger in somebody, to do things that are going to provoke them, that's going to stir up anger in them. And so children sometimes receive the brunt of our anger. Because we're mad at our spouse, or we're mad at our boss, and we can't yell at our spouse and our boss, we yell at our kids. And that exasperates our children. That stirs up anger in our children. Also, there are parents, not many, and surely they are not good parents. But they are parents who are jealous over the success of their children and try to push them down. Probably more likely in our setting today, there are parents that try to live through their children. 
which also exasperates the child. When our children are nearing independence, it can become exasperating for both the teenager and the parent. When children are, are infants and uh, you know toddlers and preschoolers and even early grade school kids, I mean, just they're just cute and lovable. I mean, you could sit there and watch a, a, a small child like this over here. Just the, the child doesn't have to do anything. Can't talk, can't walk, can't crawl, can't do anything. It's just adorable. Amen. I mean, God gives us that gift early on. But you know what happens, don't you? Yeah, they grow up. And, and, and what ends up happening is the reason why those early years are so sweet and loving is that the child is so loving and the child wants to please the parent and goes out of their way to please the parent. And you can make the child obey. You really can. When the child's a grade school kid, you can make the child obey. But when that child gets to the, the beginning to become independent, it is much harder to make them obey. And it becomes almost an adversarial relationship between the parent and the child. Teens don't always want to obey, and that exasperates the parents. You know, Diane and I survived only by the grace of God and by the blessing of a two-parent household Amen. is the only reason we survived. If you are in a single-parent household, I don't know how you do it, and I asked Diane if I could tell this, and she said, yeah, 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 I could. There, and both of our kids, compared to others, were pretty good. But compared to our standard, they challenged us. And Faith, our oldest daughter, she was really good until about 17 and a half, and it's like someone gave her a shot or something. And she just, she didn't do anything terrible, but boy, did she give us a run for the money. And there were days... Honestly, there were days with both of our kids. There were days I was ready not to put their clothes in, in, in luggage. No, I was just going to grab the clothes from the drawers in the closet and throw it in the yard and give them a $100 bill and say, don't come back. I mean, it was that bad. I'm not exaggerating. It was that bad. And Diane, on those days, would talk me down. She'd be gracious. She'd be calm, and she'd talk me down. It never failed. The next incident that blew up, it would be reversed. And Diane was ready to do it, and I would be the one that would calm things down. And so only by the grace of God and the two-parent uh, household were we able to get our children through that stage. Amen. So first, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Secondly, Parents should nurture children in the Lord. That's the second thing that's mentioned in, in verse 4. Nurture children in the Lord. If stewardship, normally we use that word to think of money, but if stewardship is the proper management of assets, really the greatest asset God gives us is our family. That's, that's more valuable than any amount of money is, is our family. And so how do we manage the, how do we steward the asset that God has given us? Well, verse 4 says to bring them up, and it says to bring them up in training and instruction. And that word bring them up, really it's the same word that's used from last week's message of how the husband is to treat the wife, and, and it means to nurture and to provide. So it, it, is, a, it is intentional, positive actions towards the good of the child in the long run. Not necessarily the good for right now, but the good for the child in the long run. Now, how can you steward this great gift that God has given us? I've got six things I'm going to mention real quick that are ways you can steward your children, no matter how old your children are. Number one, always try to create a context of grace. So you're going to create a context of grace, support, uh, respect, but also in that context of grace, you're going to speak the truth in love. So just because you've got a context of grace doesn't mean you're going to allow them to bring sin into your home and, and, and conduct sin right under your nose. And you say, well, i got to be gracious to him. No, you can still speak the truth in love. God is gracious to us, but he also he speaks the truth to lo in, in love to us in his scripture. 
Number two, be concerned about the spiritual needs of your children as much as you are their physical needs. There's not a parent or grandparent in this room that would not do everything they could to provide for their child physically. Be sure they had food and clothes and shelter. You'd be sure that they never missed an academic opportunity. Well, we need to be concerned about the spiritual well-being of our children more so than we are the physical well-being of our children. Our children should not be the ones that are the spiritual leaders of our home. That they're the ones getting us up to come to church on Sunday. That's a shame on us fathers. It's talking to fathers. That's a shame to us as fathers. Number three, don't always rescue your children. It's something that has evolved in the last 20 years in which parents have been so involved in their children's life that they rescue them. So they call the principal, so they call the teacher, so they call the coach, so uh, they call the boss. I read of one person where the parent showed up to the interview for the job with the child. The kid didn't get the job. Would you give the, the kid a job? Of course not. And so let the kid sometimes fail, not all the time, but let the child fail sometimes because God teaches us, he warns us, he holds us accountable, he disciplines us. That's part of how God grows us, and that's the pattern by which he wants us to help our children grow. So don't always rescue your children. Number four, grant privileges in accordance to demonstrated responsibility. Now I'm going to spend a little extra time on this, and I had prayed through this last night and this morning to stay calm. Lord, help me. Amen. We're in a society that everybody wants to talk about privileges. Nobody wants to talk about responsibility, and that has really infiltrated our homes. Our kids almost demand privileges because everybody else has those privileges, but nobody wants to talk about responsibilities. Uh, Alex, our student minister, shared with me some survey study information. I asked him to get this for me, and he did. And uh, this particular information was on smartphones and social media, so just stay with me for a few minutes. You can apply it to anything, but this is smart, uh, uh, smartphones and, and social media. Basically, none of the information is good. Just give them cigarettes instead. <laughs> I mean, give them marijuana instead. It'll do better than the cell phone will, okay? Okay, Whew. breathe, Kevin, breathe. So here's the statistical information. The more smartphone use among children and teens results in increased depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and other mental health issues. Also, there's a direct correlation between smartphones and the ever-increasing use of pornography among children and teens. Smartphones and social media go hand in hand. Why else does your kid want a smartphone? Is it because they want to FaceTime grandma? No. They could use your phone for that. It's because they want to do YouTube or they want to do some type of social media thing that's going to teach them the opposite of what you're trying to teach them. There's virtually no positive result in your child having a smartphone when, when their brain has not developed, which is a whole other rant for a different time. Perhaps you're wondering, should your child or teen receive a privilege? Let's say the privilege is a smartphone. Let's say the privilege is a car. Let's say uh, the privilege is they want to start dating. Let's say, let's say the, the privilege is they want a curfew. You know, uh, they want a later hour curfew. How do you decide if their responsibility level matches the privilege that they want? Well, I've come up with seven things that's going to make every kid in this room hate me. But that's all right. You'll get over it. <laughs> and most parents aren't going to like it either. And there's nothing magical about these seven things. They're just seven things that if a kid wants a privilege, they ought to be able to do this, okay? Number one, do they unload the dishwasher without being asked? <laughs> Come on, can you not show an eight-year-old that when that light shows up green, that it means the dishes are clean? They can open up the door and put everything up. If they can't reach it, just leave it on the counter and mom and dad put it up. I mean, how hard is that? You better teach them at eight because at 18, they ain't going to do it for sure. So you better teach them at eight. Number two, do they clean their room? Probably not to mom's standard. That's not what I'm asking for. It might not even be to dad's standard. But how many times, don't raise your hand, parent. How many times have you said about your teenager, man, that kid's room is a pigsty. And they want to stay out till midnight? 
And they want a smartphone? No. If they can't clean their room, why should they have that? God's not holding me back. He did not answer my prayer. <laughs> Number three, do they fold and put up their own clothes? I'm not even asking them to wash them. Do they fold and put up their own clothes? Number four, do they feed and bathe the dog they just had to have? <laughs> oh, Daddy, I, just, I promise I'll feed it. I'll, but no, you don't. That dad didn't want that dog to begin with, and you made him get it now. He's got to feed it and bathe it. Number five, do they wake up and get dressed for school and church without being badgered? You want a cell phone? Here, let me give you an alarm clock. You figure out how to use that, then we'll talk cell phone. Number six, are they in at least one activity, one group, one club that requires face-to-face -face interaction with another human being? Because cell phones and social media, though it has the word social in it, there's nothing social about it. It isolates the person in their room. And number seven, if I hadn't made anyone mad yet. <laughs> can they find the books of the Bible? You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? You want to know how adults, you want to know how to figure out your cell phone? Give it to a 14-year-old. They'll show you things on that thing you never knew was on there. And after they show you that, give them one of these and see if they can find anything. And that's the truth. I mean, we just need to be honest. That's the truth. People know more about their cell phones than they do the Word of God. Man, when I, when I was a kid, you, you guys know, some of y'all are as old as I am, about three of you at least. We stood up on Sunday nights in front of the church. Granted, there were only 20 people in the church. But we stood up in front of the church and had Bible drills as eight and nine-year-olds trying and had to find where everything was in the Bible. And we knew it. Now, maybe I can't run a computer, an iPad, or a cell phone as fast as you can, but, buddy, I can run this. What's going to get you further down the road for eternity, a cell phone or this? Okay. God didn't answer my prayer, but we'll go on from there, okay? Uh, with every privilege needs to come a corresponding level of responsibility. You know, back to our are stewarding the gift of the children. The fifth way to steward the gift of the children is don't belittle or put down your child. The sheer results of a parent having structure on the child is going to make the child feel sometimes like they're not living up to your expectations. So don't use demeaning words. Always let your kid know that you might not be for their behavior, but you are for them. There, there's a difference between not liking their actions and loving them as a person. You can love them as a person and not necessarily like their actions. And then number six, resist the temptation to live through your children. Okay, so you didn't succeed in sports, so you're trying to live through your children. You didn't succeed academically, academically so you're trying to live through your children. You didn't succeed in, in the music world, so you're trying to live through your children. Resist that temptation. Too often in our middle-class American culture, we have allowed our children to become idols. We have made our children gods in our life. We wrongfully indulge them. We let them dictate the tempo of our lives as well as the values of our life. Children, and that they never have an uncomfortable feeling, is not the goal of our life. The goal of our life is Christ-likeness. And that should be the goal for our kids, that we want them to understand what does it mean to, to look like Christ? What does it mean to walk and act and talk and live like Christ? And the best setting for that to take place is the family. That's the best discipleship unit there is, is the family. Parents must... Discipline themselves first. They need to set an example for reading the Bible every day. Fathers, praying, not using foul language, attending church, giving faithfully to the church, serving others. Children should see fathers doing that. Our responsibility as parents at any level of the parent-child relationship is to maintain spiritual integrity. In, in, in other words, what I mean by that 
is that we're to be a Christian example to our kids when they're four years old or when they're 44 years old. We're to be a Christian example to our kids. Amen. I want to give a challenge in two areas. First, I want to challenge children of all ages to honor their parents. When we were going through that challenging time with our oldest daughter, I was 50 years old. Both my parents were still alive. I wanted to, I, I felt like, man, I, I owe my parents an apology. Amen. So we were living in Oklahoma. I drove to Arkansas and for, for two days, and, and I intentionally sat down with both my parents, and I just said, you know, I want you to know I get it now. I'm 50. It took me 50 to get it, but I get it now. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't do near as bad as what you thought I was doing, but I know I kept you awake night after night after night. I know you were worried sick because you didn't know where I was at and you didn't know what I was doing. And I just want you to know you were good parents. I'm sorry for what I did. Honor your parents no matter your age. So that's the first challenge. Second challenge is to parents, specifically fathers, to be the spiritual leaders of their children. If you notice in verse 4, it says, by training and instructing them. Training is an example. By living by an example, you train them. And instruction is by teaching. I mean, is there any reason why fathers of all ages wouldn't cover this altar praying for our children today. 